Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is JJ Stranko, and I'm joined here by my friends Joanna Keeling and Nick Jefferson of Ibis Ideas for the last of our three webinars. You should, see, you should see both Joanna and Nick down in the other video boxes on your screen. Hello down there. Hi, JJ. Good to see you. Good morning. Bonjour. Buenos dias. I'm conscious this is Emilia. Good morning, I should say, as well. There's a lot of languages. <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, I guess for those of you who aren't familiar with Ibis Ideas, it's not a translation agency. It is an advisory <laughs> consultancy that is comprised of management consultants, creatives, coaches, strategists, and designers, and the occasional translator. Um, Joanna and Nick are here principally to share the results of what I think a remarkable number of interviews they've done over the course of the last few months. Um, given that it's been an extraordinary few months for all of us and might yet repeat itself, um, I'm not quite sure how they pulled it off. Um, so before we dive in, just a few numbers, a few, th a few very pesky housekeeping comments. Um, we can't give you coffee or tea. We can't tell you where the fire exits are, obviously, but we can walk you around our excellent webinar platform. Um, the most important thing for everybody today is that you should see a chat box on the bottom right-hand side of your screen um, where it says type your comment. And if you hear something um, today and just think, you know, what on earth does that mean? Or I'd like to ask about that. Or if you just generally have a question, please do type them right away into the box in the lower right-hand corner. Um, they'll come directly to us and I will bring them into the discussion. Uh, other than that, it should be a fairly straightforward process. So I guess just to dive right into it, Nick, Joanna, big question that I have is, why did you do this? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you did this, but I really wanna know why. Yeah, well, we wanted to understand why in times of great tumult and change, like the one we're living in right now and probably about to live in uh, even more so, some organizations don't just survive, but they actively kind of thrive and prosper. Why is that? What is it that makes a difference? And that's really what we wanted to find out. So we, yeah, as you said, took it upon ourselves uh, to speak to a lot of people. We, we talked to, we always planned to speak to about 100 people, but actually we were um, recommended a few others along the way as well. So it ended up being 104, all C-suite, very senior leaders um, and cumulatively leading thousands of people and, and billions of dollars um, a, a worth of, of products and services. We, I think we ended up speaking to people from about 30 different cities um, across America's Asia Pac uh, yeah. and EMEA, obviously, and a really wide range of sectors. So almost you name it in terms of sectors, FMCG, fintech, biotech, engineering, manufacturing, government, education, arts, fashion, retail, endlessly. Um, and we very deliberately spoke to people from small businesses in terms of um, size of organization, in terms of numbers of people. So maybe, you know, fewer than five people right through to people employing tens of thousands of people. And similarly, in terms of revenue, um, you know, very small, under a million euros, perhaps right through to, to billions of dollars. Um, so we kept it deliberately very, very broad. Some privately owned, some government backed, some charitable organizations, some publicly listed, some publicly owned. Um, and we asked people to give us their time. And, and as you say, at the height of the, the pandemic, um, so they were very generous and we're incredibly grateful of all the people who gave us their time. And we asked them to think about their current experiences right now, obviously in their, their current leadership role, but also their experiences before that throughout the career. Um, all of the interviews we conducted were very much on a no names basis uh, and strictly anonymized which meant leaders spoke really freely um, and gave us some pretty compelling um, research to, to deal with. Um, some of their quotes were so good that we, we haven't put any names against them, but you will see them appearing in our report and, and, and we might find some of them for, for you today, um, but they were too good to leave out. Yeah, um, just let me kind of reiterate our thanks because it was a, a, a big undertaking and we really appreciated people giving their time. So what did we learn? Well, well this really, that um, you know, there is now this huge imperative around ideas that in an age of commoditization, digitization, and, and huge geopolitical change, what we call operational effectiveness, kind of gradually getting better at things, just isn't any longer enough. It's a strategy that gives you diminishing returns. What makes the difference, leaders told us over and again, is the ability to develop and then to harness fresh thinking. 
And we call the organizations that can do that ideas-led organizations or ILOs uh, for short. Um, so, I, you know, the question, I guess, is what makes an ILO? Uh, and that was really the, the meat of the research for us. Um, interestingly, not sector. So there was no cluster of ILOs in any one industry. Also not size. Joanna mentioned that we talked to businesses and organizations of all sorts of different shapes and sizes. We found ILOs that were small and ILOs that were enormous. Also ownership, and this surprised us, and we'll come back to it, didn't have the kind of part to play that we thought that it would. We met ILOs that were privately owned and publicly owned, um, and that really surprised us. What we identified instead are that all ILOs, whether they're private, public, large, small, whatever, share five common behaviors and five common characteristics. I'm going to take you through the behaviors now at a kind of top line level. There's a lot more detail in the printed report which we're issuing on the back of this study. If you don't think we've already got your physical mailing address, and we've got lots of yours already, do please let us have it. Send it to Kirsty. K-I-R-S-T-Y at ibisideas.com and we'll make sure you get a copy of the uh, of the printed report. So let me just take you now then through these five common behaviours. Those value ideas. Now, every organisation these days says it values ideas and I can't remember going into a reception of any organisation that didn't say innovation is one of our values. The difference is that in ILO's it really genuinely is because ILOs demand ideas from everyone in their organization at all levels and all of the time. Um, so having ideas is incentivized, it's encouraged, leaders walk the talk, just part and parcel of what working for that organization entails. And crucially, innovation isn't siloed, right? It belongs to everyone because if ideas are seen as additional to the day job as opposed to part of it, then that is a problem. ILOs generate ideas, right? They're stuffed full of people who are having ideas all of the time. And that isn't because those people are necessarily particularly brilliant, but because there's a culture of doing so. You know, people are as creative as their particular manager allows them to be. The leaders that we spoke with had different views on the conditions that led to ideation. Um, but among the, the, the very popular ones were proximity to the problem. People felt that those who were closest to the problem had the best ability to kind of develop an idea to fix that problem. And that was often junior people, you know, on checkouts, dealing with customers on the shop floor. Novelty and being forced to experience new things and, and, and being able as a result of that to import fresh ideas into the business. You know, there was no preciousness, interestingly, in ILOs um, in stealing ideas. You know, that old Picasso idea of the best artists stealing. ILOs hired for intellectual curiosity, you know, people who are ready to say why, why not, what if, people who are ready to poke and, and, and challenge. Um, and then plurality. I mean, that was the single biggest factor that all leaders of ILOs talked to us about in terms of generating ideas, that we need as many different people with as many different experiences, backgrounds as possible, because when they come together, that's where ideas come from. Now, the truth of it is, though, Right? You can have lots of ideas, but they're not all equally good. And one of the things that we saw that ILOs know how to do is to separate the corkers from the howlers. And they have systems for doing so. And those systems can be formal or they can be informal, but they, they are always widely understood inside the organization so that I know where to go if I have a great idea. There's some sort of forum where I know that I'll be heard. Not necessarily that my idea will be made, interestingly, but that I'll be heard objectively and fairly. We were really struck, actually, by how this was done in so many different ways. There were some organisations that had very big, formal, multi-stage processes to this. So um, inviting ideas from, from a wide group of people and then you, you, you'd create a proposal and you'd put it together and you'd go through various panels and stages and that worked very well in fact the, one of the examples that really stayed me, with me was a senior leader I spoke to she had a, a much more junior member of her team who went through that process and was able to speak to senior leaders about his idea ultimately his idea wasn't pursued but he still saw that as a hugely positive experience 
On the flip side of that, there are a lot of organizations, particularly in some of the, the tech organizations that we spoke to, where people are just entirely used to sticking their ideas on Slack or whatever channel it might be. And they're saying, bring on the curation. I want you all to poke this and kick this and challenge this and suggest enhancements. So the idea is, is up for scrutiny so early on in, in the process. And it, that's a very sort of socialized, um, that's something that can come from anywhere. So there isn't a sort of rigid formal or informal process that you need to follow. Yeah. And there's and there's there's no preciousness around that. The thing is, of course, though, that you know, ideas come through this curation process, um, which is great, but but usually they're not then fully formed. So they need to be kind of greenhoused, you know, fed and, and watered. And it was really interesting that the vast majority of leaders that we chatted with um, said that they really struggled with this bit, that the organizational machine so often would accidentally kill the ideas in their infancy. Um, you know, one chap I chatted with said, we race to homogenize, you know, to bring ideas back into the fold because we feel comfortable with that. And so we smother them as a result. Where ILOs make the difference is they develop internal buy-in, enthusiasm, momentum. They set out what the incentives are for people internally. Um, and they're very clear on prioritization. You know, I've asked you to focus on growing and, 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 and enhancing this idea. Therefore, I know that you won't be able to do X, Y, and Z. One of the other things that came up again and again when we talked to leaders about what, what it was that made ideas kind of um, grow inside the organization was visualizing the idea. You, you know, somehow uh, authoring it into existence was a phrase that one person used. If you're able to give a shape to something, if you visualize it um, or see it, fe feel it somehow, then it's much, much easier for people to buy into. And then finally, and these five common behaviors, ILOs know how to activate ideas. And this kind of explodes one of the myths around ideation, you know, that it's all bean bags and post-it notes and beautiful people drinking Red Bull together. Because actually making ideas real is about strict governance, accountability. It's about performance management, you know, boring but important things like that, you know, deadlines and commitments for those of you who love the killers as much as I do. So it's that and, and it's resource, you know, putting your money where your mouth is. Now, thing is, of course, that you need to be good at all of those things <laughs> to be an ILO, you know, and that's what we discovered is that ILOs don't just do each of these. They know how to do them all at the same time because all of these behaviors are so interdependent. And we visualize them as this infinite loop so that as older ideas are being activated, newer ideas are being valued, generated, curated and nurtured. And if you think about this loop like a... Um, a water course in nature or a neural pathway in the brain. And it's kind of getting stronger with each and every iteration, but it is only as strong as its weakest link. So if your organization isn't performing in one or more of these areas, then a form of ideation sclerosis sets in and, and, and that's quite interesting. Let me, let me just stop you. There's a lot, um, <laughs> there's a lot here. And I know there's more, but Lots I want to. more in the report. I wanna, but I want to. I want to stop to ask a few questions, and I want to encourage everybody in the room to ask questions as well, because I know there's a lot of interesting stuff here, um, and there's more in the report. But you know, please, if anything came up, please type it in the chat box and um, and let us know. But I guess let's start from the beginning. I mean, generating ideas. Um, one of the things that you said that resonates a lot with me is sort of this idea of proximity to the problem and you know, the junior people often have more proximity to the ones that are on the shop floor. You know, how do you sort of, how do you bring those, how do you bring junior and senior people closer? How do you bring people closer to the problem across all levels of the organization? Do you want to take this one, Joanna, or should I? There are all sorts of ways. Um, I don't know about any of you. I'm a huge fan of the um, TV program, Back to the Floor or Undercover Boss, where senior leaders go and spend time at the front line of their organizations. And what happens at the end of every episode is they go back to their senior leadership team and they make fundamental changes because they have seen the impact of the ideas they're having at leadership level and they've seen what it actually means when you're there dealing with a customer, answering the phone, serving the food, whatever it might be. Um, and they understand the implications of their ideas. So they're sort of they're joining the dots on that much, much more. That's definitely very helpful. Anything that you can do to get back to that front end um, of the problem of the of the actual um, the consumer facing end of your business yeah and, and I would add to that, that this isn't comfortable right I mean 
you know, the environments where people are ready to have lots of ideas are not necessarily comfortable, consensual environments. Mm. Um, you know, one person said to me, we've got to get, uh, uh, we've got to get comfortable with, with un unconventional people um, because, you, you know, they're going to come in and they're going to tell us that we're doing things in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that doesn't necessarily work and there's going to be challenge. And that, that is what ILOs embrace. But it's not a comfortable kind of situation for, for lots of people, but you have to get familiar with it and be ready to work with it. I get, that reminds me of something else you said, Nick, um, this point about, um, you know, about plurality, about diversity. And, you know, I think yeah. one thing that, that struck me is that, you know, I spent years working for an organization, and I believe you did as well, Johanna, um, that has a very public or, uh, obligation to dissent. Um, but it doesn't mean that you have an obligation to antagonize. No, um, no, 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 no. How do you how not. do you strike that balance? It's not a balance. You just got to separate the two things out. So I, I'm not criticizing your idea, JJ. Sorry, I'm not criticizing you as a person, JJ. I, I, I'm interrogating your idea. Um, and and if if your purpose is clear, and Joanna will talk about this in a moment, then that's a much easier thing to do because it's not about you as an individual. We've got to depersonalize this. You know, we've got to normalize the idea that we do interrogate each other's kind of thoughts. There's one um, organization that we spoke with, they, they deliberately put on any problem that they've got, they deliberately put 10 teams onto that problem, right? So by definition, nine or, or you know, at a push, eight of them are going to fail. They are not going to have their idea realized um, because it will have been challenged, it will have been poked, it will have been interrogated, and it will be uh, decided that those ideas aren't good enough. And that's okay. Those people aren't kind of crying in a corner. They're, they're used to that. That's That's been normalized in their organization. And it's understanding that it's you, there might be good bits of your idea that we can take and put into another idea. It, you don't have to come up with the complete solution. No one is expected to, to do every part of the loop brilliantly themselves, but certainly they're not expected to generate a fully formed idea. And there may be things that ultimately we don't go with my suggestion, but we might take a few of the, the, the elements of it um, and, and put them into something else. Hmm. We have we've had a few really good questions just come through here. Um, two that um, that I'd like to ask now, and then one I'm going to hold a little bit till later. Uh, the the first one is actually about this point of um, you know incentivizing people and, and making sort of the, the making ideas generation everybody's day job. So the question is, you know, how do you get people in resource lean firms to strike a balance between getting their daily work done versus generating ideas? It's not versus. I, I think if you set the question up in that way, then it, it's not going to work. What we found, <coughs> excuse me, was that the minute you you suggest that ideas are on top of the day job as opposed to part of the day job, then then you've got a problem. Um, they have to be baked into everything that everyone is doing all the time. So, you know, one organisation we spoke with, forty percent of the salary that is paid to every person in that organisation every year is dependent on how well they've developed ideas that help uh, achieve that organization's objectives. So, and so that, sorry to interrupt, Nick, but that, that wasn't some little Shoreditch sexy startup oh, no, organization, no. was it? It was, it was, a, it was a, I think the person that said it is, is on the webinar today. It, it, it's a B2B manufacturer in Central Europe, um, but they're doing something really, really interesting in terms of how they're incentivizing people what they're not doing as well in ILOs is is siloing innovation right so they're not saying innovation is other there's an innovation room or there's a team that do innovation it, it's something for everyone the minute you put the innovation word on something uh, you know and, and 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 I work into some chief innovation officers but the problem is the minute you say that that it's that's for them the challenge is it's it's not for other people. You know, someone said to me in one of the in one of the conversations, the problem with it is it's a bit like in a family. If you allocate someone the title chief tidying up officer, right? What what message does that send to everyone else in the family? Well, tidying up isn't for me. So I, I think we can't set it up in this kind of either or. It it just has to be part of how we do how we do the job. I it think many of us have come across organizations that have things like an innovation room as well. And uh First of all, that the idea that once you close that door, the innovation um, is finished. Um, but worse still, that the pressure on you to be innovative in that room because they've got different colored chairs or they've got some, you know, some some cool things to play with. Um, it, it needs to spread across the whole organization all the time. Yeah. And, and another question that came through is around the process of kind of nurturing and activating ideas um, and also to some extent curating them. I think. 
you know, I, I'm, I'm always curious about, you know, is there any perfect way to curate and nurture and activate an idea? And the question that came through was, you know, did you find any correlations between the formality of the process of curating and implementing ideas and successful implementation? Because you've talked a little bit about, you know, processes, informal and formal. I think, you know, I think it's a great question. So I'll, I'll take this one in the first instance. The, the, um, it's a good question because actually, um, one person put it to me like this, it kind of at the beginning stage uh, of the ideation process, it's jazz, right? Everyone's kind of doing their own thing and we're kind of getting on with it together. Then you have curation and, and then it's, it's orchestra. Um, and, and you heard my very clear emphasis on accountability, ownership, performance management, deadlines and commitments to use that song title again. Yeah, it's, it's really, really important that we, that we focus on the process at that point. In terms of the formality before that, I mean, you know, you need something to manage the shakedown of ideas and the curation process, but, but it doesn't need to be formal. Um, it, it needs to be understood first and foremost by the people inside the organization. So that that's what matters. Um, that said, whether it's formal or informal, senior people have to keep their mouth shut, not to put too fine a point on it, at that process. Because if that doesn't happen, then junior people tend to clam up. One person I spoke with this called, called this... Uh, you know, the problem of the hippo, not the elephant, but the problem of the hippo in the room, the, the highest paid person's opinion. And if you're not careful, that person's opinion kind of dominates, right? And, and everyone else will kind of fall into line behind them. And that's a great shame because it means we don't get the ideas from the junior people who are, as we said already, most proximate to the problem. And we see um, often senior leaders don't realise quite how senior they are. You're not walking around all day saying, gosh, I'm incredibly senior. Everyone's hanging on my every word. But they are sometimes. And we, we heard from one of our interviewees that um, what a senior leader considers to be a whisper is a lion's roar elsewhere in the organisation. So if you're getting, um, if you are voicing opinions too early in the curation process, that idea becomes formed around the feedback that you've perhaps given, the suggestions you've made, the objections you've raised. And that can be as simple as a nod in a meeting room, a rolling of the eyes, a... You know, it doesn't have to be a formal rejection of anyone's idea, but the sooner you um, are seen to either sponsor it or reject it or want to change it, that becomes rehearsed and republished and, and uh, repeated across the organisation on your behalf, whether you like it or not. So the longer you can keep your opinions to yourself and allow other people to contribute, the better. Here's an interesting kind of one, which is that um, in organisations where ideas are kind of par for the course we tend to find that leaders unusually <laughs> say to people this this meeting that you're about to do where you're going to have some ideas hopefully is so important that i'm not going to come right <laughs> um that, that that is entirely counterintuitive because what every kind of leadership uh, uh course will tell you is that you know if you want to show a meeting's important you've got to turn up and, and, and be present and, and be in that meeting whereas actually what we're hearing from ILOs and leaders of ILOs is I know that when I'm there I skew the debate and so I'm saying to them this is so important this meeting that I'm not going to go. You know in fact we just had somebody comment um, in the box here that they heard exactly sort of that hippo definition or not maybe those, those words from a junior member of their staff this week, they felt intimidated in speaking up in front of their senior colleagues. Um, and, you know, I think what you're saying is if there's not, if there's not a mechanism or at least a culture of being able to do that, then you're probably yeah. stifling a lot of great ideas. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah Most senior that. leaders think they're open to suggestions. They'd say, of course, bring them to me, but they forget what it's like to feel very junior and to think, well, what do I know? How it's also that, that race to homogenize you're talking about too, right? It's this, this thing where sort of the organizational machine comes in and says, this is not how we do things. This is not the way it works. This is too right. complicated. This is too difficult. This is too expensive. Yeah. Um, what, you know, how do you, so I, I would guess, you know, how do you, how do you rage against that machine? I think you have to be very, very deliberate in saying, I not only I'm interested in your ideas, it's demanding them. And the senior leadership team needs to, to be seen to prize ideas. But also this discomfort thing that Nick talked about earlier, that absolutely be prepared to hire people who aren't perhaps going to respect that sort of hierarchy and that 
um, you know, the, the, the mm. process for ideas that ex existed, who are going to come out from their level, wherever that might be, and say, I'm not sure why we're doing this, or I don't understand, mm. but what if we stop this altogether? And we need organizations that are comfortable with those sorts of people. Yeah. We've, we've had so many good questions come through. There's a few actually that I'm going to hold to a little bit later, but there's okay. one here that, um, and I'm, I'm conscious that we need to get to the, you know, we've talked so much about the what, you know, what do they do? But, you know, the real question is how do they do it and how do they get there? But one question that, um, that came up that I thought was really interesting is that it's difficult to it's difficult to create the organizational um, desire to change if there's not something wrong sometimes how do you do that um well this is interesting isn't it because we, we talked a lot about the role of cash in ideation right some people are very clear that if you have a very strong balance sheet lots of liquidity then you have the uh, the luxury of kind of being able to think about, oh, I wonder if what if we did this, um, and we wondered uh, whether that you know that was an important feature for an ILO that you had to be cashed up, and actually that just didn't seem to be the case. The, the, the more we investigated, because of this this you know necessity being the mother of invention, we had lots of stories of businesses with their backs up against the wall, um, uh, you know, really being cornered to, to, to mix my room metaphors, but but who then suddenly <laughs> come, you know, facing an existential threat, let's put it like that, who were then able to, because of that, think, okay, how do we get out of this now? And and, and that's what they were able to achieve as a, as a result. So- Be a burning that, platform, um, as everybody says, right? So right, many exactly. people use this phrase of, we've, we've done it, we have to, um, you know, never waste a good crisis, there was a burning platform um, and it, it's been yeah. valuable to them. So if you yeah. don't have a burning platform, you... Oh, you, 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 you burn your own platform. I mean, you, you, um, you give, you find your smartest people, a small group of them, and you form a guerrilla unit and you give them a box of matches and a jerry can of kerosene and you say, right, let's see if you can burn this organization down. You know, see if you can create the kind of competitor that's going to eat us from the inside. In fact, one organization I work very closely with has done that and done it really very successfully. So that that part of the business now is, 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 is the part that sees all the revenue growth and, and, and that's where all the kind of the, 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 the future for that organization is, not, not the legacy. Um, red teaming, I think it's called in, in government circle. You know, military does it all the time, right? War gaming. Let's yeah. test where we are with this stuff. Let's see if we can kind of break it. So, okay, so we know how these ILOs behave, but I also know from you know, speaking to you that not all of the organizations you spoke to were ILOs. Um, and the question that I have is now, how do you how do you get there if you're not there? So you're absolutely right that, that certainly not all of the organizations were um, what we would describe as ILOs. There were pockets of excellence in, in nearly all of the organizations we spoke to. But and interesting, the leaders had quite a good understanding of where their particular organization might fall on some of these things. So, you know, that they're, they're wonderful at generating, curating ideas, but fall at the activation stage. Or, or we spoke to a lot of leaders who felt they weren't good at the nurture stage, for example. But no stage of this loop is any more important than the other one. They all need to be happening um, at the same time across an organization, not all by the same person or not all by the same department. Mm -hmm. So what we saw was that these common characteristics just came up again and again and again in terms of what are um, the things that are um, that are true of, of all of the ILOs. First of all, absolutely every organization that we identified as an ILO had a very, very clear purpose. Yeah. Um, now, I know there's lots of there are lots of conversations out there about purpose and mission and strategy and goals and planning. Just to be clear, um, Purpose and mission are not the same. Missions are started and finished and completed and success or failures. Purpose endures across all of that. So just to take a sort of a big analogy, NASA, for example, its mission to the moon or its mission to Mars will be completed one way or another, successfully or, or not. But its purpose to, to continue to explore and to increase the US influence in space has endured for a, for a long, long time. Purpose is why do we exist? Why, why are we here in the first place? What would not be happening if we weren't here? In all the ILOs that we identified, we heard leaders talk about clarity, but also consistency of purpose and the fact that it was widely understood. So that as senior leaders, when you go back to the floor, do the people right there understand and are able to articulate the, the purpose? 
um, and why the organization exists. If your purpose is clear, your decisions get easier. You know, if I have that North Star to guide me, I don't need formal structures and processes and approvals because I bought into the purpose. My work feels closely connected to that purpose. We had a wonderful example of um, a good uh, a good client of ours and, and friend of the business who um, runs a service, a website, um, and a service for a very important sector in the hospitality industry. Now, their purpose was to be the best friend to that sector. Um, so to be the best friend, so that that involved all sorts of things, you know, um, you know, PR and lobbying and all sorts of elements of being the best friend to that sector. Now that sector, along with many others in the hospitality industry, had its um, opportunity to trade reduced by about 98%. They saw their, their profits, their, their revenue just collapse overnight at the beginning of this pandemic. Now, because the purpose of our client was so clear, we're going to be the best friend to this, this sector, they just switched their, their, um, their missions, they switched their activity, but still sitting very clearly. So how do we support this sector through this crisis? How do we innovate with this sector to help them recover and thrive beyond this. It was very, very clear for them. And nobody had to stop and think about, um, you know, whether there's a formal process for how else we could help them. It was just super clear. Mm -hmm. You yeah, just don't build, just, you don't build this purpose overnight and it's not something that can just pivot in a crisis, mm -hmm. is what you're saying. Yeah, and I think it really helps us with that. As I say, this sort of North Star, if we know why we exist and why we're here, planning our activity underneath that becomes a lot more straightforward. It really does. Yeah. Obviously, you know, um, it does depend on, on the culture that has um, been created at your organization. And so many organizations talk to us about this, that, but well, before the crisis, we had this, um, you know, very empowering culture, or we had a very candy culture and that, that will have endured through the crisis. Um, and certainly anyone who is trying to reinvent themselves as a customer focused or employee centric organization who wasn't before hasn't done that very successfully. Um, culture is not a fixed thing, though. It's 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 not something like purpose that endures. It is it's organic. It everyone impacts the culture. So the day you join an organization, you change the culture of that organization. The way you spoke to the receptionist this morning, that changes the culture of an organization. The the responsiveness to a client that you've delivered that day, that changes the culture. Um, although having said all of that, senior leaders have a disproportionate effect on the culture and certainly on the culture of ideas. You know, the leaders we spoke to um, and their colleagues at the leadership level understand the need to walk the talk on ideas. So if your senior leadership team isn't, isn't demanding and prizing and challenging ideas all the time, mm. the chances of that happening elsewhere in the organization are, are vastly reduced. That... Um, sorry, Nick, were you gonna? No, sorry. it's me. I have I have oh. a tough I have a tough question here for you. Yeah. Um, how do you measure culture? <laughs> so I, I wouldn't bother. <laughs> I'm not sure culture is something you can measure. You can measure engagement, and you can measure net promoter scores, and you can measure all sorts of other things. I don't think culture is something you can measure. I think it's something you feel. I know um, the way I felt when I walked into McKinsey each day or HSBC or Red Bull. It's something you feel. As a customer, I know how I feel when I work into, walk into an organization. And it's not because anyone's told me about their cultural index of that organization. It's how I feel when I go in there. And it's because it's changing all the time. Um, so much of this is about trusting people and mm. presuming a level of com competence, you know, hire them because you think they're going to be great at their job, give them that purpose, tell them what they're there to do, and then let them work out the how, and they won't then fear a sort of lack of, or a withdrawal of support or a blame culture if something doesn't go brilliantly, because they will have, you know, they've, they've worked in that culture of, of, uh, of, a, of clarity of purpose and that endures. I this guess doesn't I, have to be in the innovation teams and stuff, by the way. You know, this needs to be the culture across your organization. This is somewhere yeah, you can't just talk about it. Yeah. No, on that note, listen to this. This is in the chat. I think this is really interesting. I've experienced two scenarios in the past at a big media group that managed the ideas with an inbox with votes 
Whereas at my current company, I see contributions coming from everywhere and in a kind of messy but organized way. They come through WhatsApp groups where we speak both about plans for lunch or how to fight against COVID or formal Slack channels or email chains to debate on an issue. Love I mean, that, 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 yeah. that's really interesting, right? Yeah, it is very, very interesting. I love that. But then, you know, all of this is, um, is good enough, but you then need to be hugely agile. So um, at the end of um, all of our interviews, we're saying to people, like, who do you think is having... Um, a good crisis who is responding really well and what i found interesting is that despite the seniority of these leaders these people who are you know they're, they're the assets and the 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 scope of work that they are looking after is huge international areas of responsibility so many people talked about their favorite restaurant down the road that have been forced to close down suddenly had no customers and just pivoted and just instantly showed this agility and saying, right, okay, so the customers aren't going to walk through the door and sit at the tables. How are we going to stay in touch with our customers? How are we going to still make some money? We're going to have to make some bold moves. So even though we've never done takeout before, we are going to do takeout. Even though we have never sold um, ingredients to people, we're going to do that. And so many people had these examples of agility from down the road. So we saw it at a local micro level, but the ILOs do this at an organization, at an institutional level. Um, they, um, they, they are able to pivot quickly um, and go towards where the activity needs to be. And the whole organization, because of the culture, because of that purpose, can move fast um, and without being bogged down by the sort of hierarchy. I've got a cracking example of agility. Sorry, I think you were about to say oh, something. No, great. But, um, the, the, this, is, this is brilliant. The, the Swiss Flower Sellers Association so uh, in Switzerland, like so much of the rest of the world, there was lockdown. And um, that, of course, meant that shops were closing. Um, so the uh, Swiss Flower Sellers Association was able to get to all of its members, so little kind of florists all over, you know, different cities and towns in Switzerland, um, was able to get a, a kind of cookie cutter. Um, here's, here's how to take your business online, including some sort of Shopify style platform. And as a result of that, that agility, that right, whoa, okay, let's do online now. I'm told that flower sales in Switzerland during lockdown didn't just not go down, they went up. I mean, that's extraordinary, right? What yeah. a great story. It's also extraordinary in the dead of Swiss winter. Um, I suspect <laughs> flowers were still flowers. coming from Kenya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> flowers come from elsewhere. <laughs> It's pretty good. Um, it's, pretty it's tough rude. without the flights and all of that, but no, that's really something. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. So, okay, so obviously I, you, you've, you've got this level of agility, but then you've got to be brave, you know, as an organization. ILOs are bold. They know that their new ideas won't be perfect. They might not be instantly popular. They might not get them a, a three rating in their appraisal at the end of the year. They might be difficult to implement. They, they might even be aware that a new idea might reduce their profitability in another area of the business or impact on, on one of their existing product lines. Mm. We heard senior leaders of ILO saying, I get frustrated when I hear that the organization hasn't been bold enough, where people have been too timid at an individual or at a group level, um, that they'd seen opportunities, that they thought of something, but they haven't gone for it. Because leaders of ILOs know that if you're not bold, your competitors will be, and they will get there way before you. In real ILOs, people are inviting this challenge and saying, give me feedback on this idea because we've got to go towards this. They mm -hmm. seek forgiveness rather than permission, probably more often than others. And what they don't do is let the structure and the decision making process get in the way of the pace and the agility that you need to rush to it. They're bold with their ideas, they're transparent, they share things, they, they put their vulnerabilities out there and they are still bold. And as a result, staff feel empowered and able to be bold themselves in terms of making decisions. So I have, I have a question that came through here and I have to say, the person who asked is remarkable because the fox did not come on the screen yet. Um, <laughs> but the question is, where is the cultural line between agility and chasing the latest rabbit? Yeah, it's a really good question. I saw that as well. Uh, and I know the person that asked it and I know why that question has been asked. Um, the the truth of it is you can't chase all the rabbits, right? And and Not even that fox. It's a lovely fox. Not even a fox can, right? I mean, you know, we could take this animal metaphor all the way, but... <laughs> 
you know, there was a lot of conversation um, uh, uh, around focus, you know, so so once you've decided what what ideas have got through the, that curation process, you know, that should deal with a lot of the kind of latest rabbits to use that word. But when you've decided which rabbit you're going after, that's the rabbit you go after. Right. That's when you turn the full firepower of your organization on that idea and you and you and you hunt it down and you make it happen and you are relentless and you are prioritizing every step of the way to make that idea happen project management performance management again deadlines and commitments is you can't do it all i think that's a really really good question that was asked there yeah but my my question i guess to follow up on that is that you know you talked a lot of, we talked before about institutional machines and all of that but how do you make sure things don't get bogged down by middle management by all of the different types of layers that you know have to get approval who say we can't do this. Um, I hate to bring back this point, but I think it's something that everybody can relate to. And I think many of us on this call and certainly the leaders we spoke to have experienced it at both levels. So I've experienced that as a junior person. Um, I think I can't get to the people who are saying they want to hear my ideas, but I don't know if it's time for you to get religious, Nick. Uh, yeah, well, I, the thing is I call this the problem of the priesthood. Right. So so um, in uh, I, I'm not a religious person at all, but but my understanding is that in Protestantism, one can talk directly to God. And that's kind of what we need in, in ILOs, whereas the, the, the priesthood that one finds in and, and JJ is a Catholic. But, I'm Catholic. Uh, yes. Correct. <laughs> uh, correct. It, that, the, the, lots the, of the, levels, priesthood. lots of layers. Right. But and, 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 and that there's a serious point here, which is it, it can get in the way. One person I spoke with said, you know, it drives him crazy when he hears junior people say, sorry, middle managers say to junior people, well, I don't really think the board would like that. And so the idea dies. And, and it's kind of like, well, let the board be the, the judge of that. Right. And so in ILOs, the, the really senior people are, are constantly seeking to kind of de-layer uh, and, and remove hierarchies and process as much. There's an irreducible minimum. Right. Let, let's be clear about that. We're not talking about blowing the whole thing up. But all the time and that isn't a one and done style kind of activity that's one big part of the role of a leader of an ILO is to be delayering all the time how do I make sure I'm getting these ideas back to the floor you know Joanna mentioned that earlier I think that's really really important spending some time on the um on the front line but so much of this is about the people that you have in your organization um mm this sense of, oh, I don't know what's happened to that slide. We'll, we'll see if we can come back. I don't know if we can move on to the next one from your end, JJ. I was going to talk about- Oh, it went through. It went through. Um, oh, has it come through? Yeah. Good. Sorry, I've I got it. it. Um, it's about talking about this word that we had a lot of debate about, which is which is fellowship. Um, and I, I think given that you in the end won the debate on the word neck, you, you, can, uh, you can take this and I'll come back and talk about the, the people you bring into your organization. Well, you know, I think the, the debate slash argument w was um, was around the, the, the religious kind of overtones in this. And it sounds like I'm obsessed with religion. I'm not. But, you know, religion is really good at some things. And it's really, really good at this sense of fellowship. Um, you know, it, it's, it's my relationship with whatever God I happen to believe in. But it's also my relationship with the other people who also believe in that God. And so we look out for each other. Um, and we are all in this together. I, the thing about ILOs is they're really good at creating the sense that we're all in this together and that we all kind of belong together. And the more you can achieve that in your organization, the more likely people are to have ideas because they care. You know, this in the end is an emotional thing. I don't have ideas about stuff I don't care about. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. that, that, that's a truth. I, I have ideas about the things that I, that I care about. So give me reasons to care about this organization and the other people in it, because I want to help out my fellow human. Yeah. That did I sound quite religious. That, 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 that was, that, yes. Uh, <laughs> there's a really interesting question. The Quakers question will be knocking on your door. Uh, <laughs> there's a question that I've seen come up from, um, uh, that, that relates to this is what advice do you have with COVID world workplaces where everyone was at, is at home and therefore less creative and, and prone to generating ideas? And certainly in the last six months, we've done a lot of work with clients about how do you manage these remote teams um, where you are forced to be remote from your clients and from your stakeholders. Um, the first thing I'd say is it wasn't quite as overnight and dramatic as, as in some ways we've been made to feel. I think it's a long time since any of us have worked 
nine to five, Monday to Friday, sitting with the boss and then everyone else around them. We've been managing and working with remote stakeholders, be they team members, senior leaders, clients for a long time. So first of all, you've got to give yourself a bit of credit. Like you, you got this, you've been doing some of this stuff for a long time. Mm. Where I think there is real concern, and, and I would agree with the person who asked the questions, where this gets very challenging is I've seen extraordinary levels of transactional and operational efficiency throughout all of this, people getting stuff done. Um, to get back to the agility point, I can't believe how quickly workplaces got people set up and running and managed to, to move their entire operations to people's back bedrooms. What I think is reducing with every week that we we go through this is these um the forms of casual collaboration the casual ideas the the meeting in the canteen for for a sandwich the the walking to the tube together at the end of the day that stuff and this is where senior leaders need to be very deliberate how are you going to force that level of collaboration and interaction and it's not just about sort of zoom bingo and all of those things that were so popular at the beginning of this it's about saying, I'm going to drop a case study into this team meeting. I'm going to add on um, a few excellent questions at the end of um, each of our sort of transactional updates. Um, and just I need to, to create a platform for some debate and for people mm. to feel like they can start throwing ideas around. Mm. There's a comment just come in, which you might have seen as well, JJ, which is so good. I wish I'd written it myself, frankly. It says the easy to like behaviors that get so much attention. <laughs> I knew you'd want to read it, so I wanted to let you read it because I knew you. <laughs> are only one side of the coin. They must be counterbalanced by some tougher and frankly less fun behaviors. A tolerance for failure requires an intolerance for incompetence. A willingness to experiment requires rigorous discipline. Psychological safety requires comfort with brutal candor. Collaboration must be balanced with individual accountability and flatness requires strong leadership. Innovative cultures are paradoxical. I know who wrote this. I'm going to buy that man a beer because uh, that is <laughs> That's poetry. It's it's some, it's so poetry. Good. It's, <laughs> if it was easy to be an ILO, we would all be an ILO, right? We, we, we get this. This is not difficult and you're having it's not easy. I mean, it's, it's challenging and it takes a lot of very deliberate attention. And particularly this very deliberate questioning of, so why is that process here? Why is that serving us? Does it feed our purpose all the time? So we're going back to, to, to just checking all the time that this is working. So mm -hmm. I think the commenter also has multiple beers on offer now. Um, oh yeah, someone else has just offered to buy them a beer. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> but, but there's so, you know, we're, we're getting to the end of the time and, you know, I want to, I want to give folks also the opportunity to ask any last questions that come through. I know there were a few other questions that came that, I, that, that, that Nick and Joanna are going to answer afterwards. They were a little more process based, but I guess in the meantime, um, can you talk a little bit about what folks should expect? Cause there is so much more here. There's so much more content. There's so much more that you've written. Um, what's next? Uh, what's next is the printed report, which will cover these topics in, in a lot more detail than we're able to do uh, on, on a webinar. Um, lot, don't worry, you've still got lots of animals and, 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 and pictures, um, but uh, no, a much more you know, deeper dive into, into our findings, which we've kind of scratched the surface of today. Um, so again, I'll just, I'll just say, if you don't have, uh, if you think we don't have your address, if I haven't, or Joanna or someone else at our organisation hasn't asked you for it, then do send it to Kirsty at ibisideas.com and we'll get you a printed report um, uh, in the next uh, uh, week or so. That's great. Well, I guess in the absence of any other questions, um, just want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us today. Um, and again, as Joanna and Nick said, stay tuned for the full report to arrive to you shortly. If there's any other questions that come up, um, just get directly in touch with Joanna or with Nick and I'm sure they will get back to you straight away. Uh, nothing more to say than just to enjoy the rest of your day. Um, whoever's buying beers right now, uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's early. Beers, it's early. Write that you. person down and ask them for one. Um, and again, thanks very much. Goodbye. Thank All you right. so much, David. Thank you. Bye bye. See you, everyone. Bye. bye.